Good morning, church family. Morning. Let me try it again. Good morning. 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 I want to welcome all of you who have joined us here and who have joined us online. Today is a remembrance service where we remember our loved ones who went to be with our Lord Jesus. As I was preparing for this opening, um, I thought it was really appropriate for me to share a Bible verse that will comfort us and that gives a hope to us. And I found this verse in Revelation, and I know this, will, you have heard a lot about it. In Revelation chapter 21, for it says, he will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Although it's really, really hard for us to live on this earth who are left without our loved ones, but I think this Bible verse is giving us a hope and assurance that in one day when he returns, we will all be rejoicing together and there will, and then that day, there will be no more death, sorrow, crying, or pain in Him. So let us continually put our hope in Him so that we can rejoice in that day with our, all of our loved ones. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you, thank you for being our comfort, and thank you for being with us through your Spirit in this time. Lord, it is tough for us to live on this earth without our loved ones, but we thank you for your promise that you gave us through John, that you will wipe every tear and there will be no more death, sorrow, crying, or pain when you come back. Lord, we want to lift you up today as you are the first fruit of the dead and the hope of all nations. Please be with us as we worship you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's sing our praises to God for the hope that we have in Him. We invite you to stand as we sing together.
strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Because when we see you, my strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away. Jesus, yours is the victory. 
to remember our loved ones who are not here with us any longer. We want to remember our veterans who sacrificed their lives to give us this wonderful country. Perhaps we don't need to say we want to remember them. We just remember them in our daily lives because we just love them and miss them. As I'm serving the Grief Share Ministry, I notice the dilemma from believers time to time. We know when our loved ones are passed away, they're in heaven with our Lord Jesus Christ. We know that they are in the presence of God. We know that they are free from all the pains and sufferings. We know that they are in the best place ever in their eternal lifespan. However, we're grieving here. We feel sadness, pain, anger, regret, guilt, or depression, and screaming, why? We're grieving. Is this because of a lack of faith? We are supposed to be happy and joyful because we know where they are now. But why are we sad? Why we are mourning? Grieving is a natural reaction because we loved them. If we did not love them, we do not grieve. And Jesus wept with people. For instance, when Nazareth died, Jesus wept, even though he knew that God would raise Nazareth from the dead. Jesus wept, and he knows your grieving hearts. Our Heavenly Father also knows your grief because he lost his one and only child. When we go through this grief journey, let us cherish the times we spend together with our loved ones. And let us cherish the beautiful, beautiful memories that we had with them. Truly, they were such a precious gift from God for all, all of us in our lives. Please read the bulletins and you will find the list of our church families lost in this year. Let us comfort each other and pray for each other, and especially for those who sacrifice their lives for us. We sent them home where our Heavenly Father is, and we know for sure that they arrived at the gate of heaven safely and joyfully. There will be no more death, no more grief, no more crying, and no more pain. 
let us take a moment of silence to remember them and their family.
Be still, my soul. Be still, my whole soul. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence among us and in us. We thank you for your fellowship and friendships. Bless our time together that we may reflect your truth in our lives and carry your love in our hearts. Today we ask you to be in a special way with the people that have lost in this last year their loved ones. Teach us to use our time wisely. Lord, I ask that when people enter our church, they feel you all around them. I ask that we remain hospitable to each other and to outsiders, and I ask for your grace and forgiveness when we fall short and fail you. O gracious and holy Father, give us wisdom to perceive you, intelligence to understand you, diligence to seek you, patience to wait for you, eyes to see you, a heart to meditate on you, and a life to proclaim you through the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ our Lord. Holy Spirit, we ask that in our worship service today, you would fill us with your power so that when we leave and go out into the world, we may speak the word of God with boldness and effectiveness and live our faith wherever we are. We ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. going to take a few things off this pulpit before we begin. I uh, just wanted to uh, make mention to you that next week we have a potluck. And I'm going to tell you, I got a picture of the potluck last, week, last time we did it, and it was just beautiful. I mean, the different types of food, ethnic food, it was unbelievable. And if you're a guest today, I would really recommend coming next week. You want to try some wonderful food? I mean, there was like a sushi platter display. It was incredible. So I do hope uh, you will make it. And we're trying to uh, warm you up to a congregational meeting immediately following. So if you're a part of this church family, you're welcome to the potluck. If you're a guest, you're, you're welcome to the potluck. And then afterwards, we're going to have a meeting uh, that's going to be a budget meeting and sort of our nomination meeting. So I hope you'll put it on your list and uh, make the appropriate preparations. Portage Avenue Church does quite a wonderful potluck, praise the Lord. Uh, also, I wanted to just let uh, our welcome team know this because I know that uh, as a staff, we have had lots of conversations with the wel about the welcome team and our vision and our dream for the welcome team moving forward. So what's gonna happen on the 27th, so not next Sunday, but the Sunday after, I wanna meet with all of the team that's part of the welcome team in the lower auditorium. Uh, there will be a table in the back set aside with signs that say welcome team. And we're just gonna meet and I wanna share with you our heart of where we as a staff have been dreaming for you. We've been praying about this and we wanna just present it to you. So on the 27th, anyone that's part of the welcome team, I would like to see you downstairs uh, and we'll have, like I say, a, a large table reserved for us. All right, so the uh, title of the sermon today is A Faulty Tower. Uh, I'm making a correlation with one of my favorite comedies of all time, but it is appropriate. Even though I didn't spell it correctly, I know I spelt it the way it should be spelled. But uh, I do want to talk to you about this faulty tower today. Uh, before we get into more of the details, I just want to read you the story. We've been going, we started in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and we've been going through uh, Genesis together as we've noticed God continually beginning, starting new. And as he starts new, we get to see God's promise to his people. And I believe we are in this new beginning as a church, and we're rebuilding, coming out of a, a time and a season of, of two years of COVID. And so I wanted us to just go through these stories so that we can see how God starts new and begins to give his people not only further promises, but he equips them to move forward. And so that's the purpose of this theme. And so now we are in Genesis chapter 11. I'm going to start in verse 1. I'm going to read the whole, uh, the whole biblical passage to you. 
At one time, all the people of the world spoke the same language and used the same words. As the people migrated to the east, they found a plain in the land of Babylonia and settled there. They began saying to each other, let's make bricks and harden them with fire. In this region, bricks were used instead of stone and tar was used for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower and the people were building. Look, he said, the people are united and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse the people with different languages. Then they won't be able to understand each other. In that way, the Lord scattered them all over the world, and they stopped building the city. That is why the city was called Babel, because that is where the Lord confused the people with different languages. In this way, he scattered them all over the world. Okay, so uh, this is a strange story for me uh, growing up. First off, when I first read this story as a young, as a teenager, young man, I thought it's really odd that it's placed in the biblical narrative in this particular spot. Because we just came from Noah. We spent a lot of time talking about Noah, right? The last three weeks. We just came out of Noah. We just came out of Noah's genealogy. And then this story hits us. And then what happens? Then then we go right into Abraham's story. And so we have... In between Noah and Abraham, we have this sort of random, it feels very random and odd story right in the middle of these two major stories. So at, at best, it seems odd to me, but actually, if you were, I, I also found it very troubling to read this passage and to read this text, because um, if you're not taking a biblical worldview, and I don't always take a biblical worldview. I allow, sadly, sometimes my societal norms and my traditions and my cultures to infiltrate the text. And when we do that, we often misinterpret the text. We create an enormous amount of problems. And we don't even sometimes realize what we're doing when we read God's word. Because we're so in- inundated in our culture. And so for the longest time, I would read this passage and it just didn't put God in a good light. It seemed to me that God was being rather petty, manipulative. You know, he's like a, he's like a little schoolgirl that's not, you know, getting in att- any attention on the playground. And he's having a little, like, temper tantrum. And, and I, I didn't understand the story. And so, being a young Christian reading this, I just said, well, obviously that's not who I serve, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So obviously, I just don't understand the story. And so I would just sort of move past it and just say, well, I guess I, I don't understand it. And, and for a long period of time in my early Christian faith, I just didn't understand this story. And people would sometimes tell me, you know, give me a little bit of a synopsis of the story, but it never actually set in with me. And I want you to know that part of that is because of the way I grew up. See, it's fascinating that the way you are nurtured, the way you are taught, can infiltrate the text. And so let me just give you an example of what I mean. See, I grew up in a society where even as a young child, I was educated, indoctrinated into a system that believes strongly in humanism. That is the belief in the goodness of humanity. In other words, humanity deep down are good people, and that through human ingenuity you can achieve anything in your life. You hold the key to the future. Messages on the walls of my school would say this, knowledge is power, and thus you have the power to be great. Doesn't that sound encouraging? I mean, uh, it would even go, you have the power to make a change for the better. And all of these ads on my school walls and the messages that were promoted by my teachers and society were meant for encouragement. They were not meant to harm me. 
They had the best of intentions. The only problem is, is that it flies in the face of the biblical narrative, meaning this is not the biblical worldview. And if we apply our society ideology to the biblical text, we get strange interpretations that make no sense and even contradict God's word. And then we have all these inconsistencies that we can't seem to explain. Meaning, if you apply the worldview of humanism to this text, it gets really awkward and strange to actually read it. For instance, you would ask the question, why would God want to split the people up? Why would God make various different languages so they are confused? Why would God not want humanity to be united? We always talk about unity in the kingdom. Don't we want to have this kumbaya moment where we all as a society, we come together and we hold hands and we seek unity and peace and prosperity? Isn't that what we want? Why would God be against this? Does God not want humanity to get ahead and be successful? What type of God are we serving here? Why is God acting in such a manner? These are all the questions that I have, and I have many more. With a worldview of humanism, that, those are viable questions that you should be asking. And it shouldn't make much sense, this story. But if you have a biblical worldview, this story can be interpreted completely different, 180 degree difference. If you have a biblical worldview, I'm going to show you today that this story is about God's grace and his mercy in our lives. But it depends on what ideology you bring in. If you're seeped like I was as a young man with humanism, you're going to look at me and shake your head. If you take a biblical worldview, you're going to interpret this differently. And this is how misinterpretation happens constantly in our society. So let's tackle the first and most pressing question. What is a biblical worldview in regards to humanity? Is humanity inherently good? Let's start with that question. If you have been following these sermons in the series of New Beginning, you will have noticed that we started in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. You will also notice that humanity was created in God's image, meant to live for eternity. And then something happened in a garden with a fruit tree. If you want to hear more about this story, I would encourage you to go back to these sermons on our website. Go to pachurch.ca. You can check us out on social media as well. But regardless, God loves his creation. It was good. And yet, we hear that God wanted humanity to be in relationship with him. And thus, a healthy relationship is not controlling, and it's not manipulative. And so God gave humanity a choice a choice to follow him or a choice to go another way that will lead to death. He even warned humanity. Well, the end of the story is that humanity eventually chooses death. It had far-reaching implications. First and foremost, there's a lifespan for us all, and eventually we will face death. Also, such disobedience brought about not only death, but also destruction, and we see it, violence, and we see it so early in the story of Cain and Abel. Over time, it gets so bad that literally there is no one honorable or righteous within all of society other than one man by the name of Noah. So God floods the earth and even shortens the lifespan of society in order to preserve his creation as humanity was living so long, it was creating an enormous mess of violence and destruction. And now after the flood, God reminds Noah that humanity is still wicked, even as a child. But because of Noah's faithfulness and his relationship with the living God, the Almighty God promises him that he will never destroy the earth like he did in the flood ever again. So that is God's promise to humanity. And we see that promise in the sky by God's creation of the rainbow. 
Now, I've just given you a short synopsis of what has gone on leading up to this story. Now, within the context, we find that immediately following Noah getting off the boat and after he worships the living God, the next part of this story is that Noah is plastered on the ground, drunk out of his mind. It's quite a spectacle. He's publicly naked and passed out. Furthermore, one of his sons tries to publicly humiliate him and dishonor his own father. That's pretty bad. In any society, that's bad. So right away, as God makes a promise to humanity, God also says, but clearly humanity is still wicked. And we, hear, we see it right away as they get off the boat. We see evidence of this throughout history, this biblical worldview, over and over and over again. I'll give you just a few instances. Some of them are not going to be comfortable for some of us. It might get a little personal. But let's, get, let's not get quite as personal. Well, it might be personal for some of you, depending on where you came from. We see through history how so many virtuous and humanitarian ideologies and causes often over time become corrupt, do we not? I mean, look at the ideology like, let's talk about communism. If humanity is so good, why does this ideology never work out in practice? I mean, we want to share our goods, equip the, equip the working class, give everyone equality, and in a theory, some would say it's quite virtuous. But why does it never work out in application? I mean, it actually does the opposite. What happens is we're all going to come together. There's not going to be a class structure. We're going to share our, our profit margins. And then what happens is it gets rather oppressive. People are slaughtered. There's only a few people. It's totalitarian rulership. It goes opposite of what they're utopia was supposed to be and it happens like time and time again i mean look at russia under communist rulership did anyone think that was a success where millions of people were slaughtered many more were oppressed and just a few were wealthy in this totalitarian society It went from economic equality, ideology, to the worst case scenario of totalitarian rulership, where only a few had the power. Or what about China? How's that working out? Does anybody think there's free speech in that country? What about the millions of lives that were taken and were slaughtered to get people to submit to Mao's reign? I mean, in theory, Communism is supposed to be about sharing our economic prosperity, and yet it turns out oppressive time and time again. And no one, by the way, joins these communist movements thinking, oh, well, I'm signing up to slaughter people, and I want to impress people. And no, they have these ideal goals, this utopia goal. But every one of those communist countries, what do they make sure they do? God is stamped out. And time and time again, we have massive tragedy. I mean, in theory, doesn't it seem like some of you would say this is a good idea? But in practice, it turns so ugly so quickly. And it's great tragedy that happens for the sake of some theoretical utopia that never pans out. But I suppose it's easy to pick on other countries. Why don't we talk about our own country and the West in general? We love to talk about our freedom here, but we might just be a tad hypocritical when we talk about freedom here. Many of our Western nations, including Canada, are enslaving or at least oppressing poor nations for their national resources or even worse, for simple profit margins. 
Some of the clothing and the luxuries we buy in our current society come from countries where there is no ethical workplace environments. They, they, they have none in place. And these corporations send the work overseas to get the cost down. And that is at the expense of oppressing people. I mean, we say there's no slavery or slavery is behind us here in the West, but is it really? Or has it just taken a different look, a different form? Does it just look a little bit different? Maybe it's better hidden. Maybe we're more sophisticated that we hide it behind a veil of secrecy that goes on somewhere way out there. We talk about being so progressive. I cannot stand that word. This doesn't seem progressive to me. It seems like we have the same problems we had in the 18th century. But why don't I keep continuing on? Let's make it more uncomfortable for us. We often like to criticize the ancient gods that surrounded the Israelites, how barbaric they were. Well, let me tell you about the ancient gods. The most graphic of them all was Moloch and Baal. And Moloch and Baal was a very attractive god. It catered to our wants and our desires. And maybe in return, you might have to sacrifice a child or two. And some of you would say, well, how terrible that is. Currently, just in Canada alone, there has been nearly 75,000 abortions in 2020. That's the statistics. And in the U.S., it's nearly 930,000 children. And so if you put U.S. and you put Canada together, the statistics, you have one million aborted children just in these two nations alone. That is far greater sacrifice than what Baal and Moloch asked of its people. And I ask you again, are you sure we're so progressive as a society? Or have we just gotten more sophisticated? We use different language. We don't call it a baby, we call it a fetus. That's far greater than anything Baal or Moloch ever asked of, his, of their people. I think we are so much similar to the ancient times in this regard. We continue to sacrifice children for the sake of our own desires and wants, and thus innocent lives are taken on a regular basis here in this country and elsewhere. But let's continue. I'm not going to talk anything more. I could keep going. But let's talk about Christian organizations. Or you know what? Not a Christian organization. Let's talk about faith organizations. There was a great faith organization of godly men that were the men that upheld society for God's people for a very long period of time. They loved the people. They were people of the word. They were close to God's word. They were people that did all of the humanitarian care and helped the poor. These were godly people. They were people that were admired within society. But yet... By the time Jesus came onto the scene, he called them out for their corruption. The group I am speaking of are the Pharisees. We have such negative connotations with this group of people because of the gospel stories. I mean, we even say, don't be Pharisaic. What does that mean? Don't be legalistic, right? But historically, they were the good guys. They were pious. They loved God's people. They loved God's word. They were the ones upholding God's word in a time where no one else was. They were the ones helping the poor when no one else was helping the poor. Over time, though, the sin of humanity took over. And when Jesus came, it was far, far from its original intentions. And it was corrupt. And Jesus called it out. I could give you more and more examples, but I'm going to stop right here. There are so many examples. We could just go through history. It's irrefutable, the historical proof for a biblical worldview of humanity. It is profound, and it all starts in that creation story. It all starts in that garden. And I don't, you know, society can try to sell you whatever they want to sell you. 
But again and again, you're going to be faced with the biblical worldview. We can't, we can hide it, you can try to deny it, or you can face the reality of the situation that we are a broken, sinful group of people. That when we gather together without God, bad stuff happens. It might take a generation, it might take some time, but bad stuff happens. I could talk about so many organizations like this, even within our own denomination, but I'm not going to. I'm going to stop there. We have to come to the reality and take account of our own brokenness. We we have to come to this point where we recognize our sin, our hatred, our lust, our anger, and the list could go on and on and on. I know it's hard to do that because we don't like to take account for our problems, but but the, God's word is all about that, fessing up. That's confession. And I know it's easier to just sort of like stand aside and just put it behind me. But no, we have to face that reality, come to that reality. And when we come to this revelation, this story about a tower comes alive. So let's talk about the story. <clears throat> First, You see humanity, we've just talked about these few instances. We see humanity trying to achieve lofty goals without God. And I know some of you will say to me, you will say to me, but you know what? There's been many Christian organizations that have gone corrupt, Jedediah, that have done evil and wicked deeds in the name of Jesus Christ. How awful. And I say, yes, and that's more of a reason we need to cry out for God. Because even the Christian organizations fall short. And if they don't have accountability, we get ourselves into a lot of trouble. And that includes the Christian organizations. I'm not trying to put us on a pedestal here. We all struggle. We get together. Look at how organizations come together. And they have the best of intentions. And over time, what happens? More and more bureaucracy, more and more corruption. And before you know it, they've lost sight of what they originally were. It happens in, I could, I, I, we could spend all day talking about this. But I don't have the time. But, so, our first point that we just need to get clear with all of us. Without God, our goals lead to destruction. I want you to know this, that any organization that promotes humanitarian causes, but I don't see God at the center, I'm always hesitant. Because I believe God, it doesn't always happen. Christian organizations, sometimes they just put God to the side and they go corrupt. I get it. But God is an amazing accountability person. Because we are called to humble ourselves and come before each other and confess and cry out to him. And every Christian organization should have an enormous support and accountability system. I have one. I have a leadership team. I have a dozen men and women that oversee what I do. That is really important. If I just ran the shop here, that would be dangerous. It would be dangerous. And if any of you just ran shop and did your own thing, without that accountability, it is dangerous because you are a fallen, broken human being that is saved by God's grace. Do we understand that? If you think you're above it, you've already failed. You're not. Secondly, we have to come to grips with this human characteristic that gets so ugly if we are not careful, and that is the attempts we have of trying to hold on. Humanity was trying to hold tightly to this goal of not being scattered, that they ultimately, and what they ended up doing is ultimately undermining their goals. You have to realize that in the, in, in the, where this is placed, humanity and their multiplication, and their, their, this is a fragile state for humanity. There's not a lot of people at this point in time. We already know the effects of what happens when you put humanity together without God. What happens? It's called all out destruction and violence. We had a flood just previously to prove that. If this goes on, 
They are going to destroy themselves, and if there's not other people to populate the land, how does the population grow? See, what what we're saying here is, if we take a biblical worldview, what we see here is not God trying to hold humanity back. This is God trying to protect humanity so that they can they can continue on, that they actually can multiply and reproduce. And this is completely an opposite interpretation of a humanist ideology. See, God's not a little schoolgirl on the playground going, oh, you didn't play with me, Why? You know, crying their eyes out. That's not God. He's not that petty. He's actually trying to help you all, help me, so that we could be here today and worship him. That's why he did it, because he loves you. And we know just previous, all the mess that has happened. God's heart was broken. And by the way, time and time again, previous to Genesis 11, it has this description of God's heart hurting. Have you ever felt so much pain, been so devastated from something that you almost feel like you're having like a, like a heart attack, it's called a panic attack. Have you ever had that happen to you? That's what they're describing in the Old Testament. They're describing God having this pain in his heart because he's so devastated over this creation and the decisions they are making that are hurting themselves. And so this is not a story of God holding us back. This is a story about God being gracious and merciful and loving us and saying, I want you to continue life. I want to give your ancestors hope. I have more in store for you and your children and your great-grandchildren and your children's children. See, it's just another story, again, where it exemplifies God's continual mercy and grace in our lives. And then there's this strange irony that comes because Sometimes we as human beings, we, we have this real ugly characteristic where we sometimes hold on to that which we fear we might lose. We hold on to it so tightly. And in the end, we end up losing it anyways. I think of, of a parent who holds on too tightly to their kids and are so controlling because they're afraid of losing them. And then in the end, what do they do? They lose them. And they actually undermine their own goals. And this is what has happened by humanity building the tower. They're actually holding on with fear, fearful of losing that which they already have. And fear is such a deadly chemical. You put fear in the mix of a group of human beings and watch it explode. That's why God's word says that he didn't give us a spirit of fear or a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. He doesn't want us to live in that fear. But you always see when humanity starts to go really in the wrong direction, you see the enemy just sprinkling in. It's like pepper. He just sprinkles in a little bit of fear. And then all of a sudden there's confusion, there's rumors, there's um, people you know, speaking ill of each other, because of fear, and before you know it, it's gotten combust, combustible. It happens in churches, it happens in organizations, it happens in nations. And you know, God knew where this story was going to lead to. They want to be remembered, it says. We talk about this Hebrew word, we talked about it last week. The word is zaher. Uh, that is to remember. And the word is not literally used in this story, but it is implied because humanity wants to be in the New Living Translation. It says famous. I believe the better translation is to say they want to be known. There's negative connotations with being famous for some of us. Like, I don't want to be famous, but I do want to be known by my friends and my family. I want to have a legacy. Don't we all? It's a human characteristic. We remember our loved ones and the ones that sacrificed so much for this country today. And it is a human condition to want to be remembered, to have a lasting legacy. And, we, and I hope we don't forget it. And that is what people of the time seek by building the tower. They, they want to be known, but they do it without God. They try and build a lasting legacy, but to what effort? 
What did they accomplish? I mean, let's just look back. Think of all the great empires of the world. Where are the great structures of the Babylonians, the Assyrians? We just have fragments of that powerful, those powerful nations. I went to visit the city of Rome. I saw the ancient ruins. It's just a tourist attraction. It's a mausoleum of the past at best. It's pretty broken down. It's old. It should be. It's debilitated. Most of the great empires and their monumental structures are at best simply reserved as maybe a tourist attraction or it's just been long forgotten at worst. What happened to the supermen and the superwomen of this world? What, where, who, how have they gone away? They seem to have all gone to the grave where most of their lasting legacy is long forgotten. All these powerful nations, these powerful emperors, these powerful kings, where are they now? Do you hear much? There's just fragments that we have of their legacy, if even we have anything. See, when you try to build your own human, your own buildings with your own human endeavors, you find historically they just become decrepit and forgotten. But see, God wants us to have a lasting legacy that goes beyond the confines of human history. A legacy that lasts for all of eternity. I want you to know, can you imagine the homecoming you will have as you help and serve and are part of someone else's faith journey? Can you imagine what that'll be like when you see them in heaven? It's far greater than any building here on this earth. It's far better than any structure that will just deteriorate over time. God wants us to be part of something better. He wants us to be part of something that will last for all of eternity. And what these people were doing without God was building a legacy that was going to deteriorate and matter very little. It had no purpose and meaning. God knew it wasn't going to be remembered. Even if they'd stayed there, they would have destroyed themselves anyways. A legacy with God is for all of eternity. See, God sees beyond just this world and the, and the circumstances that we are dealing with in the immediate. He sees an eternal plan that is beyond our human endeavors. He wants us to participate in his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Meaning Jesus commands us to go out in his authority and make disciples. See, there is a building, but it's an eternal building. It's something that's going to last for all of eternity where we're going to have to celebrate with others. See, we're making a legacy that goes beyond the infrastructures of this world that will deteriorate in time. We are building something that will last for all of eternity. And yet sometimes as I say that, I get so caught up in the temporal. I get caught up in the, the, the immediate problems and the immediate structures that I need to build. And I lose sight of God's command to go out by his authority, Jesus' authority, to make disciples. But if we do that, it will have an eternal lifespan. And as a byproduct, it will, be tra- will bring transformation in our immediate society. You want to truly be remembered long beyond your lifespan, long past some earthly history book, then pursue God's kingdom. Be obedient to his word. Pursue a relationship with God and watch the impact you will have. It will exceed the lifespan of any structure in this earth. Pursue God's kingdom because it will last for all of eternity. Amen. Worship team, I would like to have you come on up. Let's continue to worship a little bit. Uh, I want to say a prayer uh, as we close this time and we enter into worship and Could you bow your heads with me and let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your eternal promise. We thank you that you are gracious and merciful and you continually look after what is best for your people. Lord, thank you that you have been the same yesterday, today, and forever. That you are not wavering in your convictions. You're not wavering in your promises. You are not wavering in your love. And I just ask that you would help us to give our lives to you and trust you in 
all these aspects that we don't always understand, but we would trust you knowing that you see the bigger picture. Lord Jesus, give us the tenacity to pursue you as you desire for us to be in relationship with you. We love you and we praise you today. In Jesus Christ's name we say, amen. Amen. Let's worship. Oh, and before I do anything more, kids in the word. I keep forgetting, but that slide came up. Thank you. Ian, thank you, thank you, thank you. So children, if you so like, you're going to learn more about God's word. We have kids in the word. The teachers are in the back. They're waiting for you. I hope you will have fun. Parents, by the way, uh, just so you're aware, we the Sunday school, the kids in the word goes about 10 minutes into Fellowship Cafe. So this is a good way for us to encourage you to join us for Fellowship Cafe for, you know, 10 minutes. Have some coffee and tea with us as our children will be learning more and more about Jesus. Their mem- the older class, I mean, my daughter's like got more scripture memorized than I do right now. It's embarrassing. I got to work on that. I mean, she's got a book now. So the older group's memorizing and memorizing. It's great. They got God's word on their heart. So Parents, thank you so much. Go ahead, Jeremy. Let's respond in singing as we sing about our need for the Lord and as we come and confess before him uh, that we find our rest.
Portage Avenue Church needs to be a church that is centered around Jesus Christ. He is the one we seek each and every day. He's the one we go to for any decision. We don't do our decisions on our own. We come together. When we don't have unity, we come together, we pray, and we seek God. He is the one that holds us together, binds us together, and leads us forward. And I want to say this last word. Look at what this group was trying to do. They were trying to build a major structure out of fear and holding on and not losing something. We cannot make decisions as a church out of fear. When we get fearful and anxious and we're trying to hold on to something, then we need to step away and we need to seek the Lord. We cannot make decisions out of fear or a loss of something because that's the group that didn't act appropriately. As a church family, we need to be moving courageously, boldly. It doesn't matter what ministry it is in Jesus Christ's authority. Whether it's our refugee ministry, our cooking class, whether it's our youth and young adults, you name it. Need and natter, whatever it might be. Our English classes, it needs to be centered around Jesus. And we need to not be making any decision out of fear, but out of God's authority, his power, his love, and his assurance that he will go with us. Amen? All right. Wow. Amen? Okay. Good. All right. I'm, I'm going to force an amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, I wanted to say, you know, I want to say, a, can I just say, I said it at, at a funeral on Friday, and I just, I, I love this benediction. Come on, let's stand up for a benediction. Here's God's word. Now to him who is able to do more abundantly than all that we could ask or even imagine, according to the power at work within us. To him be all glory in the church, in Christ Jesus, throughout all the generations, forever and ever. And can God's people please say? Amen. Amen. Blessings. Please join us in the lower auditorium. We're going to have coffee and some treats. Blessings. <laughs>